You have you have two minutes. Two minutes till you better speed that thing up. All right, now now I'm hot. Uh, anyways, I know you couldn't hear me. I was talking to myself, but uh, I have seven o'clock. Even though Bobby's going to join us in two minutes, so um, we'll go ahead and get started and let him catch up to us. Um. So tonight we're going to be in Mark chapter 4. We're going to cover a majority of Mark chapter 4. Um, other than, well, we're going to, we're going to cover, cover the parables and some of the um, explanations of the parables and some, some things that Jesus goes through there. Uh, we're also going to be, um, we're going to be in the Old Testament a little bit, but if you like to go ahead and turn and find it, uh, we are going to be in Isaiah for a little bit as well. Jesus quotes Isaiah, uh, Isaiah chapter 6. Jesus quotes Isaiah in this section, so I'm going to flip back there and reference it um, and read it together. So if you uh, want to go ahead and turn to that, you can. Uh, as always, I want to welcome all of you here, especially our visitors, if we have any. Um, we're thankful that you're here. Sometimes this can be a, a large room to speak up in, but we hope that you'll do that, and as well as our members to do that as well. I'm going to need you tonight. I've got some, some questions for you, so feel free to speak up. And then, as always, I'd tr- I like to uh, welcome our, our live stream folks, thank them for being here with us and participating with us, um, and hope that they can be with us as soon as they're able to. All right, well, we're going to begin our class tonight with a word of prayer, if you'll bow with me. Dear God and Father, we come before you um, at the close of this day as we set aside time to come together as a group, to open your word together, to study together, um, and hopefully to grow closer to you, not only in knowledge and understanding of your word, but in in wisdom and application so that we can uh, truly be people that are active in your work here on this earth. Um, and we ask, Father, that we will be that people. We pray that you will help us as we participate tonight, that you will give us uh, thoughts to uh, comprehend and to think about and to meditate on and to stay focused on your word and the opportunity we have before us. In your, your son's name we pray. Amen. Okay, so as I mentioned, we're going to be in Mark chapter 4. Um, and just Real quickly, kind of, well, well, we'll talk about that in a second. Let's just read Mark chapter 4. Uh, we're going to read verses 1 through 9, and then I want to just kind of talk about how we've gotten to this point maybe a little bit. So Mark chapter 4, verses 1 through 9, it says, Again, and again, he began to teach beside the sea, and a very large crowd gathered about him, so that he got into a boat and sat in it on the sea. And the whole crowd was beside the sea on the land. And he was teaching them many things in parables. And in his teaching, he said to them, Listen, behold, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured it. Other seed fell on rocky ground where it did not have much soil. And immediately it sprang up. Since it had no depth of so- oh, I'm sorry, yeah, and immediately it sprang up since it had no depth of soil. And when the sun rose, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no grain. And other seeds fell into good soil and produced grain, growing up and increasing and yielding thirtyfold, sixtyfold, and a hundredfold. And he said, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Okay, so before we get into this parable, what's the scene that we see with Jesus? What's happening? Yeah, and I wanted to mention that earlier because we didn't hear a lot about that in chapter 3, but that's kind of how chapter 3 started. Remember, I think it was like a break between 6 and 7. Um, the Pharisees went out and tried to, to, you know, plot with the Herodians against him in, in verse 6. And then in verse 7, you know, basically the crowds were around him so much that, you know, it was going to crush him uh, because they wanted to listen to what he had to say. And I just want to remind us, just real quick, because I know we've got a lot to cover, but why was that? Not why was, we'll talk about later why people wanted to kill him, and we've talked about that, and we'll continue to, no doubt. But 
why was there such a large crowd just to that point to where he has to literally separate himself from himself from them just to even speak to them? Okay, so there's a lot about, they, they've never seen anything like this done. There's a lot about wanting to be healed. I think there's another thing too that we read about in Mark in the first chapter. They what? Have, they may have listened to John the Baptist who said. Okay, so they, they already knew this, this was coming and may have believed it. I think that's part of it. And that's getting a little bit closer to another part that I, that I have. But what else, what else did they say about Jesus? Yes. Yes, in Mark chapter 1, verse 27 and 28, it says, And they were all amazed so that they questioned among themselves, saying, and this is after he healed the man um, that had unclean spirits, said, What is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And at once his fame spread throughout all the surrounding region of Galilee. So you're exactly right. Healing people is drawing him a crowd. And, and so much so that I think that's a lot of what we see in, in Mark chapter 3, where they're coming around him just to touch him. If they could just touch him, then, he could be, then they could be healed. And so we see a lot of that. But I think there's also this coming, wanting to know more about his teaching and the authority that he has in teaching. Because they haven't been able to hear that before. And I don't want us to dismiss that. Because I think we can all see that people are gathering around him because of the healing. But I think a lot of times we as human beings would just be selfish and say, well, I'm healed, I'm, I'm done, I don't need to hear anymore. But I think that they stick around, that crowd stays, it continues to grow, in, in fact, because of that ability for him to speak to them in a way that they had never heard. All right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. And, and I think that's something that we need to dig into. Uh, Paul's statement was, or comment was, that I wonder if his teaching in parables really satisfied them. If they're truly coming because of his teaching, and his disciples obviously had trouble with it because they had to ask him what it meant, then did it really satisfy the others? And I think um, that's a point that I want to try to draw out of this. So I appreciate you bringing that up. Any other thoughts on that? Okay, well, before we actually talk about the parable, because Jesus does do, in fact, that he, he explains it to us um, so that it doesn't leave a lot of doubt. But before we do that, I want to read what he says when the disciples come to him and then go back and look at the parable with the, um, the actual explanation together. So let's look at the middle section between those two things, which is verses 10 through 12 of Mark chapter 4. So after, it says, and when he was alone, those around him with the twelve asked him about the parables. Now that's something that I think is very important to understand. There's, a, there's at least a group around him after, or with the twelve that ask him this. Um, and so maybe that's a little bit of insight, hopefully, into what Paula's statement was. I don't know what that group was. You know, we talk about the 70 and all those that he sends out. Maybe it was a little bit broader range of his followers, or it could be even more than that. That are, What does this mean? So they're hanging around. So I just wanted to bring that out. It says, and when he was alone, so there's obviously less, those around him with the 12 asked him about the parables. And he said to them, to you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God, but for those outside, everything is in parables. So that... They may indeed see, but not perceive, and may indeed hear, but not understand, lest they should turn and be forgiven. All right, so this is in Isaiah 6, and we're going to go back to that. But is that an odd statement when you just read it on the surface? Okay. Why would Jesus say that to them, and I think that that's important for us to go back to Isaiah to understand it. So before we kind of step back and go, well, that's crazy. He's only going to have a few or a select few, and he's not going to, um, you know, give wisdom to all or understanding to all. I think we got to go back to Isaiah and, and understand that. So turn back to Isaiah with me in Isaiah uh, chapter 6. I debated back and forth because it's really um, only a few verses of this chapter that 
he references here, but I think it's important if you're, if you're unfamiliar with this chapter that we read it all together. So if you are familiar with it, I'm sorry, we're going to rehash it. But if you're not, I think it gives a little bit more context to what Jesus is saying and why he does. So bear with me on that. So the first five chapters of Isaiah are really about God's destruction and, and judgment coming upon the people of Israel. Uh, he, he speaks a lot about that. And then he gets to this uh, chapter 6, and this is where uh, Isaiah sees um, this vision. And, and, you know, we kind of talk about it. Did somebody make a comment? Oh, sorry. Okay. So chapter 6 and verse 1. In the year that King Isaiah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called. And the house was filled with smoke. And I said, woe is me, for I am lost or undone. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, here I am, send me. And he said, go and say to this people, keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy and blind their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. Then I said, How long, O Lord? And he said, Until cities lie waste, without inhabitant, and houses without people, and the land is a desolate waste, and the Lord removes people far away, and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. And though a tenth remain in it, it will be burned again like a terebinth or an oak, whose stump remains when it is felled, the holy seed is its stump. Okay, so if you noticed, uh, I don't know if you did or not, but basically right there at the end of chapter 10 is what Jesus quotes. Lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. Now, let's understand exactly what's going on with Isaiah. So he sees all this and God says, we need to send a messenger to the people and Isaiah raises his hand, send me. I will go. And he says, go and tell them this. What is, what is God ultimately telling there? What is, what is God telling him to go and to do? Okay. Teach to an audience that's going to be resisting. Yeah. What's, what's maybe... Um, Y'all are trying to read my mind. What, what's maybe some that's, that's a little bit before that, that, that you hear that, that God says, make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy and blind their eyes? Like, what is ultimately being said there about the message? Because if you know anything about the Bible, and I think uh, all of us in here do, we know that's not God's goal, right? That well, if they just don't get it, you know, I'm not going to try to help. Or, you know, God doesn't just, he's not just out there trying to wipe us out. He's, he's given us forgiveness. He's given us these things. So it's kind of, I guess, counteractive to what God is. So let's make sense of it. So what is he ultimately saying and telling Isaiah to go and to do? He's telling them to go to preach to him. But what's going to be that outcome of that preaching, I guess? Okay, and so when is he supposed to stop? Like, what, is, what, is, what does he say? He asks God how long, and what does God say? Yeah, until, until that's all destroyed, until, 
it's all done. But did that change him in that message? He was still supposed to go and to do that. And they would be dull in their hearts. They would be blind. Their eyes wouldn't be able to see because then they would be able to turn. But they're not seeing that. They're not understanding that. They've been given all these prophecies. They've been given all this preaching and they're not doing it. And so now judgment is coming upon them. And that's ultimately, I feel like what this is saying is continue preaching, but the outcome will be the same because their ears or their hearts will grow dull, their ears will be heavy, and their eyes blinded. Who, who may be um, example, or uh, who is a good example of of that? Of a dull heart, blind eyes, and ears that just won't hear in the Bible in the Old Testament. Yeah, what does it talk about with Pharaoh? Right, is he his heart was hardened, hardened his heart, hardened his heart. Now, in the face of all the miraculous things that were done for him, because I think a lot of times we go, well, if, you know, if he would just do something miraculous for me, then I would believe. Well, in the face of all of those things, it didn't matter. It didn't matter. He was going to harden that heart and not be willing to let those people go. And I think that's exactly what you see with the Israelites and then ultimately what is happening with Jesus. So any, any thoughts on that before we go back to the New Testament with the parables? Yes. Yes. So, so let's do that. Let's springboard then back to the New Testament because if we understand that from Isaiah and understand ultimately what God is telling him to do, then why does Jesus quote this here? What is he saying? Actually, let's read it again together. Let's read it again together and just make sure that we read where he brings that. So he just does the parable. He says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. And then he says, and well, and then when they're alone, they come to him. And he said, to you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God. But for those outside, everything is in parables so that they may indeed see but not perceive May indeed hear, but not understand, lest they should turn and be given, or be forgiven. So what, bring it back, let's bring it back to the New Testament. Why would Jesus say that here in light of what we just read in Isaiah? Okay. Yeah, I mean, I agree. There is a group that is here, right, trying to find out more. I think that tells you right there. But what else? Why, why would he say that there? He, okay, he is setting that up. He is setting that up to tell them. And I think that that's ultimately what I'm trying to get to without just, you know, telling you what I think. And I'll, I'll just tell you, I'll tell you what I think. Um, because I'm not doing a very good job of, of asking the question. Sure, lest they turn, there's an action right there. Good, yep. Okay. Am I wrong in that? No, I, I think you're exactly right. Sure. Um, and I think that's going to be seen in the reaction to the parable. And I think that's back to what Donita is saying is that, yeah, it's, he's going to say that. But ultimately what I, what I want to get out of this and I hope that I can convey to you all is it, it's very clear that there is a hard-heartedness addressed in both Isaiah and in um, Jesus or in, in this parable when he talks about that. Israel was God's people. Israel saw signs. Israel was preached to. And yet right here, God tells Isaiah to go and do this. 
and they will not listen. In fact, have you ever seen, I think it's even more prevalent today. We have a lot of people that are just, I mean, so polarized on a lot of things that it does not matter what you tell me. It, well, it's not even going to sink in because I'm not even going to let it get to my ears. And I think that's the whole point of he who has ears, let it, I'm not even going to listen to it. I have no desire to listen to it. In fact, we talked about that when we were talking about the Sabbath and, and healing and some of those things. It's like they didn't even care if he was able to do it. They didn't even care that he was uh, performing these miraculous signs right in front of them. They just wanted to see if they could catch him. That's the type of people that we're ultimately getting to here. It's not that we're going to hide it from them because if they find out, they'll end up repenting. That's not what is being said. If they understood, then they would be forgiven. They would turn, but they're not going to. And I think that's exactly what Jesus says when he subtly talks about before that, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Because in Isaiah, it talks about the fact that that's the one that turns and is forgiven, is the one that has ears and can hear and eyes that can see um, and a heart that understands. So um, you hear it? You ask for understanding, you meditate on it, you hunger and thirst for it. You don't grow dull, blind, or deaf in that situation. And I wanted to just add back to kind of what you said is, I think that's a lot of the point of who is here asking for more. Maybe parables were difficult for them to understand, but you can walk away and say it's not worth figuring out, or you can stay and, and learn more about it. Darrell, did you have your hand up? Yes. 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 Yeah, Darrell's comment, if you couldn't hear it, was that the destruction of Israel was um, imminent at this time with Isaiah and the destruction of the Jews uh, coming not too, too much farther from where Jesus is at this time is also imminent and has been decided by God. And, and there again, that judgment is there for them. All right, any other comments? Yes. Oh, hang on just a second, Jay. Sorry. Hang Yeah. You're going to have people that do this, and this is going to happen. And you're also going to have people that believe it, and what they do is just fantastic. And I think he's, he's just letting out, and we've seen it as Christians. We see it happen all the time. Some drop off, but there are many that stay the course, and that's what you're going to find in the end. Yep. Very good point. Jay, did you have something to add to that? I was going to follow up on the real. Okay. Yes. Because they were into idolatry. They had two choices in life, God or idols. And they chose idols. Yep. So because they chose idols, they were rejecting God. They didn't want to hear what God had to say. They didn't want anything to do with it. Yep. They had their idols. Very true. Any other comments? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yeah, good point. Yeah, a, a parable or a, a story was given to, to David, and it just incensed rage until he realized that he was that man. Um, and I think that's a, a good comparison. All right. Um, well, we'll keep moving on. We got about 20 minutes left. Um, so here's the, here's, here's the explanation of the parable. And this is a parable that we've all heard. I just, I want to read through that and then maybe, 
make a few brief comments about it. Uh, 13 through 20 of Mark chapter 4. And he said to them, do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? The sower sows the word. And these are the ones along the path where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. And these are the ones sown on rocky ground, the ones who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy. And they have no root in themselves, but endure for a while. Then, when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately they fall away. And others are the ones sown among thorns. These are those who hear the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. But those that were sown on the grounds on the good soil are the ones who hear the word and accept it and bear fruit thirtyfold, sixtyfold, and a hundredfold. So just a few thoughts that I had. Um, one that I think always gets me is like, I can't believe y'all don't understand this. If you don't understand this, you're not going to get any of the rest of them. I don't think that's kind of, I think Jesus is more saying, I need you to get this. Because if you can get this, then you're going to get more and more of it. You're going to understand more and more of it. So, you know, when, when you, I think in translations, um, I don't know if Jesus was being as, um, as harsh or as stern as is more of like, you know, when we've been in, in work meetings before and it's like, okay, we need to get and understand this so that the rest of it will make sense. And it's not you're dumb for not understanding this. I think it's more about uh, so that we can make sure we get the rest of it. So that was just kind of my thought on that and something that I wanted to bring up. So just a quick question. How, is, how, was, how was Satan able to take away the word that is sown in them? That's what he says. Satan takes it away and it's like birds, that they devour it. So how is Satan able to do that? Sure. Sure. I agree. Um, I think it's kind of maybe a little bit of that cares of the world, but I think it's more back to a little bit what we talked. Think about a hard path. This was a hard, beaten down path by who knows what that they're used to seeing. That's what he explains. Let's just call it our road out here. Seed is not. In fact, if you've ever like seeded your yard and got a little bit on your driveway, if you had a paved or concrete driveway, I promise you it didn't do any good. Now, doesn't matter. You'll grow a weed somewhere in that thing when it cracks, right? Weeds will find their way, but for some reason, grass isn't going to grow on your asphalt. But yeah, it's exactly right. The birds come in and eat it because it's not even, it's not going in there at all. And Satan ultimately plucks that away. And I just think it's important to read there who uh, Jesus calls out on that with them, because um, I think a lot of times we And we're going to look at this later in some of the other um, things, but I think a lot of times we put so much pressure on ourselves in sowing seed um, that it's clear in just hard hearts that won't listen, uh, Satan is at work getting that seed out of there as fast as he can. Um, And I wanted to to mention that. Um, So two more quick questions. I think we all know the answers to these, but I think we need to say them out loud. How do roots protect against tribulation and persecution? Think about roots. Think about what they do. Why is that important? If you don't have good, strong, solid roots, tribulation and persecution comes, what happens and why? Okay. Okay. So having that anchor when persecution and tribulations come, it doesn't change the wind blowing on the, the seed or on the uh, plant that's down there. What, what holds that plant there, though, is that. It doesn't maybe necessarily change what's happening above the ground, but it does allow it to anchor down because it has that solid root. Now, let's look at, uh, the reason I wanted to bring that up is let's look at the thorns. Does having a solid root keep it from being choked out? Sure. Okay. Yeah. Very good point. Yeah. On account of the word. Yep.
I agree. They, they will be persecuted and trouble will come on account of the word and having those deep roots and understanding that those trials will come, but in the end, I'm rooted in Christ is going to keep them there. Ethan, did you have your hand ready? Yeah, um, and that, that's a good point. I'm not trying to make stuff here that's not here. I, I hope you understand that. But I just, I feel like th- there's such a good analogy here for us to overlook the symbolism between true plant. I mean, that's the reason he gave us this is true growing plants and then um, hearts. And, you know, I think a lot of times we can be rooted and grounded sometimes in Jesus Now, maybe with thorns, they're more shallow, but we can be rooted and grounded, but yet there are things out there that we want more than we want Christ, and they come in and and ultimately choke that out. And it may not be instantaneous, but um, you can have deep-rooted plants that if you've ever seen in a thorny area that just, they're choked out. I mean, I've even got trees on my property that have been killed by huge vines that ultimately grow up around them. Um that I think it's just very important for us to, to say that. Now, I think a lot of this, this is on the verge of the seed being sown, and this is at the point of the message going out there. So I don't want to, to miss what Paula mentioned, but also think that we can apply some of that uh, to us. And then the last thing I want to mention, and I don't have a lot of time left, so I'll just say it. I do think it's interesting that, that Christ talks about differing levels of fruit bearing, um, I think that's important to grasp. I don't think that he's um, necessarily, he's going to talk about it a little bit later about, you know, to, to those that have more will be given and, and, you know, those that don't more will be taken away, but, or even what they have will be taken away. But I think there's a point being made that it's a process, so fruit needs to be, bearing fruit needs to happen. But at the same time, there may be different levels of that bearing fruit, and there's also different... Uh, opportunities for people to bear that fruit. So I think it's just important for that, especially when he's talking to his disciples, because think about all the disciples. There's some that we don't know much about. Now, that doesn't mean anything, not trying to discount, but we don't know much about them. But there's some we call, you know, those super disciples that we know a lot of what they did. Now, does that mean that the others didn't? No, but it may mean that Peter was one of those hundredfold, and then some of the others may have been that less. So I just, I want to make sure that, that all that is put out there um, for what we see here. All right, any, any comments? Yes, sir. Sure. Sure. Yeah, good point. When the disciples asked for uh, help and understanding, he gave it to them in a kind way. And I think that's, uh, that's important for us to, to take away from it. Any other thoughts on that? Yeah. And another kind, yes, another kind. So in those situations, how are we going to respond with the various problems that are presented to our heart? If our heart is hard, it's not going to accept it. If our heart is soft, well, it might accept some of it, but we're going to face trials. I believe he's just elaborating on. Sure. Yeah. Good point. Okay. 
Um, let's move on to, to verse 21 through 25. And he said to them, As a lamp brought in and put brought in to be put under a basket or under a bed and not on a stand. For nothing is hidden except to be made man manifest, nor is anything secret except to come to light. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. And he said to them, Pay attention to what you hear. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you, and still more will be added to you. For to the one who has, more will be given, and from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. All right. So we're not given an explanation here. So what is, what is the point of the light or the lamp under a basket parable right here? Okay. Light is meant to be seen. That's right. Doesn't do you any good when it's uh, underneath a basket, does it? What else? I believe this without everybody knowing. You believe this? What you're going to tell me? Oh. Oh, okay. Gotcha. I believe the truth, but I'm going to tell you because I know how you're going to respond to it. I understand. All right. A hidden light? So I can hide my light in the bushes. Okay. A hidden light? Yeah. I may believe it, but I don't, want to, I don't want everybody to know I believe it. Okay, in light of what else we read in here, what does the light also do? Why do we use light? Huh? Okay, it lets other people see. It removes the darkness. And what hides in the darkness? Yeah, the bad stuff. Okay, the bad stuff. It exposes the things that are there. You shine light in a room because you want to know what's in there. Well, guess what? If anyone has ears to hear, let them pay attention to what you hear. With the measure you, it will be measured you, and still more will be added to you. It, this is talking about exposing some of that, right? Right on the heels of some of these things that we just talked about with hearts. It's a little bit of that... that exposing and ex we're trying to look into our heart well guess what put the light on the stand don't cover it up find what's there and this is where I almost I agree with the parable and I think we see it in other books but I almost view this as Jesus saying I'm that light on that stand that we're going to expose and manifest. We're going to, we're going to see this open if you'll allow it to be that way. If you'll allow for these light, this light to shine into your heart, I'll expose it. And you can see where you are on that. And I think that's so important with the metaphor of light. Yes, we are seen as lights, as Christians, to shine to the world and to be that light. And Jesus is seen or is is I am the light, but I think in this situation, He is that light shining into our hearts to expose that in us and let us see what is there that we're not afraid for Him to expose it. Because our heart is that good heart that's receptive and not dull um, with blinded eyes and closed ears. Any, any thoughts on that? Anybody want to uh, have any other ideas on that? Okay, and one more thing I meant to say is Jesus says the light and Jesus says the word and the word does that. It reveals what's in our heart. And I think Isaiah showed us that um, when he comes before God, when he sees that, his immediate is just how sinful he is. And I think the word that we're able to read and understand shows us that and exposes that, that we, we see that in ourselves. Um, okay, before we get to the last two, I, man, I tell you, I always give Sterling and Ethan a hard time, but I'm going to run out of time. We're going to do it, though, and they can, Ethan, you can just take on where, where I leave off. Please turn, if you have your Bibles, to Amos chapter 9. Um, we're going to read verse 13 through 15. So the last two, the first parable was about seeds. The last two are about uh, seeds, and I want to, I think we can't go forward with this seed analogy, especially when it talks about the kingdom without looking back into the Old Testament with some of the prophecies. So Amos 9, 13 through 15. 
Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when the plowman shall overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes. Him who sows the seed, the mountain shall drip sweet wine, and the hills shall flow with it. I will restore the fortunes of my people Israel, and they shall rebuild the ruined cities and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and drink their wine, and they shall make their gardens and eat their fruit. I will plant them on their land, and they shall never again be uprooted out of the land that I have given them, says the Lord your God. And then if you want to turn over, but Jeremiah 31, 27, and 28, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will sow the house of Israel and the house of Judah with the seed of man and the seed of beast, and it shall come to pass that as I have watched over them to pluck up and break down, to overthrow, destroy, and bring harm, so I will watch over them to build and to plant, um, declares the Lord. So, basically these prophecies, and I think I had one more, and I think I may have read the wrong one with Jeremiah, so apologize for that. But these, the prophecies that I'm, I'm wanting to show here is that they are used in the Old Testament as um, the, the glory of Israel being, being brought back. So it's, it's what they've been looking for, right? And so when they hear parables about the seed, I know that we kind of have talked about how that may be guarding their eyes a little bit and being able to understand that, and they're as, actually asking those things. But it shouldn't have been new um, completely to them, especially some of the scribes and Pharisees that would have obviously known this type of language. Because that's ultimately what Jesus is u- using, is that you were told this in those prophecies that I will plant them on their land and they shall never again be uprooted. That's what you're looking for in that. But guess what? Here's the kingdom. Here's that kingdom that's coming. And as Sterling kind of talked about uh, last week, the um, or on Sunday, the um, upside down kingdom. All right, so three minutes to read the next section and keep those two passages in our mind. It says, and he said, the kingdom of God is this heaven is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground. He sleeps and rises night and day, and the seed sprouts and grows. He knows not how. The earth produces by itself first the blade, then the ear, and then the full grain in the ear. But when the grain is ripe at once, he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. And then uh, in verse 30, and he said... With what can we compare the kingdom of God, or what parable shall we use for it? It is like a grain of mustard seed, which when sown on the ground is the smallest of all the seeds of the earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows up, becomes larger than all the garden plants, and puts out large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. With many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them without a parable but privately to his own disciples, he explained everything. Okay, so I'm going to just go through, uh, rather than kind of talk through this like I've tried to do on the rest of them and just kind of give you some of my thoughts. You see here in the first section, the farmer, all he does is he sows the seed. Now, again, I think we, in this parable, see that that's all that's done, but I think, you know, there's some things as, as seed sowers that, a farmer may be able to do with some of the ground and some of those things to help prepare it. But in the end, he can't force the growth. And I think that's the whole point of what is here is that he can't force that growth. He goes to sleep and whatever happens, happens with that seed. I also want to note that there's something else that is said. Jesus is very specific in this about first this comes up, then this comes up, then ultimately the grain He goes through all of the process of that. And I think that that's important for us to see is a process. And then ultimately, that process has a purpose. There's a harvest that's coming. It's not just that it's going to grow up. There's a reason for that growth to ultimately mature into that fruit. So it has a purpose. Um, There's a reason for that planting and then that ultimate growth. On the uh, mustard seed, I think we can all understand that. I, I do think it's important to talk about, um, you know, he, he talks a lot about the, the mustard seed and how small it is and then how big it grows. Before you, if you'll just give me one second, I'm going to read one more passage because I think 
I want to tie this back to some of that Old Testament prophecy. Ezekiel 17, 22 and 24. Thus says the Lord God, I myself will take a sprig from the lofty top of the cedar and will set it out. I will break off from the topmost of its young twigs a tender one, and I myself will plant it on a high and lofty mountain. On the mountain height of Israel will I plant it that it may bear branches and produce fruit and become a noble cedar, and under it will dwell every kind of bird in the shade of its branches. Birds of every sort will nest. And then there's more to that, but I wanted to tie that back to Ezekiel to show some of this uh, verbiage and, and language that is used here by Christ um, should not be new to them. So let's not be a people that have dull hearts, heavy ears, or blind eyes to the Word of God. Thank you. I got half attention here. Do what now? Yes. Okay. End of chapter 4 and all of chapter 5. We try to read that here, but it definitely helps if you go ahead and read it and are uh, familiar with it. So end of chapter 4, all of chapter 5. Thank you.